Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. When a team like the Cardinals has been around for over 120 years, we tend to find some unusual stories and circumstances about that team. While we're aware of how the club has called three major cities home during its lifetime and captured NFL championships in 1925 and 1947, we'll dive a bit deeper today on when football was football to share five of those odd or perhaps unknown stories. And we'll start with one of the strangest names ever for a pro football team. Let's begin on January 17, 1917, when the Cardinals organization was first incorporated in the state of Illinois. Care to guess the name? We can't make this up, but management incorporated the name of the football team as the, get ready, Racine Cardinal Pleasure Club. Note that the name Cardinal was singular, not plural, as in Cardinals. We're not sure why the term Pleasure Club was added, but it certainly does not sound like a football team, if you know what I mean. In fact, it sounds like something totally unrelated to football, Pleasure Club. Well, the club was a member of the Chicago Football League in 1917 and finished with a 3-3-5 record, including two indoor playoff games held in January of 1918. The league had a four-team playoff consisting of the Cardinals, the Tornadoes, the Mohawks, and the Evanstons, with future Cardinal Patty Driscoll, prompting the Chicago Daily News to declare on December 22nd of that year that the Racine Cardinals have proven themselves to be the best of the travelers in the Chicago League. Alas, being the best of the travelers in the league did not help the Cardinals much in the playoffs as they fell to the Tornadoes 21-7. Thankfully, the name, (laughs) the Racine Cardinals Pleasure Club, eventually disappeared and simply became the Racine Cardinals. Next, in 1917, no single individual owned the Racine Cardinals organization since it was a neighborhood athletic club with dues-paying members. By 1927, the team, by then known as the Chicago Cardinals, did have some identifiable owners. This revelation helped us to unveil another obscure fact in the history of the Cardinals. When the club reorganized on April 22, 1927, The official legal papers filed with the state of Illinois revealed that the organization was owned by five individuals who were Chris O'Brien, Thomas Burian, John Taylor, James Taylor, and Mrs. Frida O'Brien, the wife of Chris O'Brien. While Chris O'Brien maintained the majority shares of the team's stock, it is interesting to note that Frida O'Brien was legally recognized as a part owner of the club. While we have not really researched this too deeply, we do believe that Frida O'Brien of the Chicago Cardinals was the very first female to be an owner of a team in the National Football League. Can you name an Olympic gold medalist in 1932 who also played for the Cardinals? Of course, the great Jim Thorpe, who was a Cardinal for one game in 1928, won the gold medal in both the decathlon and the pentathlon at the 1912 Stockholm Olympics. Later, halfback sprinter Ali Madsen grabbed browns and silver medals during the 1952 Olympics in Helsinki. But did you know that the gold medalist in the decathlon at the 1932 Los Angeles Olympics was also a Chicago Cardinal? Let us introduce you to James Aloysius Bosch, a 1931 graduate of the University of Kansas where he was also known as Jarring Jim 
for his crushing runs from the fullback position. As a great all-round athlete, Bosch was also a star in basketball and track for the Jayhawks. He qualified for the Olympics by capturing the AAU decathlon and then surprised the field at the Los Angeles Olympic Games by grabbing the decathlon title while establishing a new world's record for that event. For this remarkable accomplishment, the young man from Marion, South Dakota was presented with the 1932 Sullivan Award as the nation's top amateur athlete of the year. Then, without fanfare, he was on to the NFL in 1933, first with the Cardinals for a couple of games and then with the Cincinnati for five contests. After signing with the Cardinals on August 15, 1933, the Chicago Tribune noted that Bosch appears certain of a roster berth because of his driving power and all-around ability. The gold medalist was listed as a starting fullback for the Cards in the preseason opener against the not-so-powerful Aurora Ideals in Illinois, but he injured his ankle prior to the game. However, he returned for the next exhibition contest and scored a touchdown against Freeport, Illinois. On September 27, 1933, Bosch was in the starting lineup for the league opener at Pittsburgh. Even new Cardinals owner Charles Bidwell gushed about his fullback's potential in an interview with the Tribune, Bidwell said, and talk about power at fullback. Just watch Jim Bosch. Bosch started the first two regular season games for the Cardinals, but then for some reason was traded to Cincinnati and helped the Reds defeat the Cards 12-9 later in the season. Overall, Bosch totaled 70 yards on 36 rushes for the year and also completed 6 of 26 passes for an additional 60 yards. It would prove to be the only season in the NFL for Bosch, who later served in World War II. But today, we remember Jim Bosch as the world's greatest athlete in 1932 and another important and proud part of the history of the NFL's oldest team. And speaking of the oldest team in the NFL, the Cardinals can also claim another first in league history. On November 6, 1929, the Cards participated in the Pro Circuit's very first night game. Originally, the Cards scheduled back-to-back road contests against Frankfurt and Providence on November 2nd and 3rd. Frankfurt captured the victory in the first game, edging the Cards 8-0 in a terrible rainstorm as described by the Philadelphia Inquirer and a wonderful example of sports writing for that era. The paper said, a pour down of rain created havoc as Frankfurt's revamped football team registered a splendid victory over Ernie Nevers and his Chicago Cardinals in a lake, which formerly constituted as Frankfurt Stadium before the deluge broke. The half-drowned scoreboy succeeded in hoisting the final figures before the continuing rain sent him dripping homeward. That same storm forced the postponement of the Providence game the next day, which was then rescheduled for the evening of Wednesday, November 6th, when according to the Boston Globe, Providence will have its first floodlight football game. Behind the heroics of Nevers, the Cardinals blasted the Providence steamroller 16-0, which the Boston Globe called the first night football game played in the National Football League. Nevers tossed a 50-yard touchdown pass, scored on a short run, kicked a 20-yard field goal, and booted one extra point to account for all the Cardinals scoring. The football itself was painted white for better vision at night under the portable lights and resembled a, quote, large egg, unquote, according to a statement later put out by the Pro Football Hall of Fame, which then added a media quote that stated, there was a panicky feeling that the player who made the catch would be splattered with yellow yolk. Don't say that too fast. Finally, there have been many, many tough players throughout the history of the Cardinals. Petty Driscoll played with multiple concussions in the very early days, while Charlie Trippi was not afraid to initiate fights with fearsome defenders such as Ed Sprinkle of the Bears. But we'll share a tale that includes a little different type of toughness. It began in 1945 when halfback Elmer Angsman from Chicago's Mark Mount Carmel High School was in the backfield for Notre Dame in a game against Navy. According to the book Leahy's Lads, it was a challenging game for Elmer. In the middle of the second quarter, Navy's Dick Scott 
caught Angsman with a forearm in the mouth, knocking out his four upper front teeth, yuck, and causing his four lower front teeth to be jammed into his gums. He ran to the sidelines where he was met by coach Hugh DeVore, who was shocked by the severity of Angsman's injury. DeVore said, Elmer, you better go to the locker room. Through a mouth that was spurting blood, Angsman replied, Nope, I don't want to. I want to go back in. He then played 54 minutes that day despite his injury. No one never doubted his toughness or his devotion to his team. End of quote. Later, Cardinals coach Jimmy Councilman recalled, Angsman was no heralded star at Notre Dame, but an incident in his career really impressed me. Against Navy, he was hit so hard in the mouth that he spit teeth like kernels of corn. Yet I found out that he was back on the field. A guy like that tough, I wanted. Councilman later drafted Angsman in the third round of the 1946 NFL Draft, and a year later he scored two touchdowns in the 1947 NFL Championship game win against the Eagles, while also establishing a new rushing record for an NFL title game. So thank you for joining us on our journey tonight as we explored some strange but very true tales from the archives of the Cardinals. We'll do it again in the very near future since the history of the Cardinals does appear to be endless. On our next episode, we're going to interview Bears founder George Hallis as he recalls the early days of the Decatur Staley's and the Chicago Bears. After all, ladies and gentlemen, anything is possible in the Sports History Network even an interview in 2021 with George Hellis. Thank you. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876 including t-shirts long sleeve shirts phone cases mugs blankets pillows towels and even shower curtains go to sportshistorynetwork.com row number one for access to the full row one catalog and for gallery prints and gift items plus get a 15 percent discount off all prints on the row one pictorium gallery with coupon code shn15 follow the link on the show notes